Hello. Although I've been designing for theatre for many years, it wasn't until I was commissioned to design the costumes for New France, uh, Fortress Lewisburg Restoration, that I became intimately involved with textiles. During my research for this project, I was in Paris and given access to the Richelieu collection of textiles, a collection established by the Duc de Richelieu in 1736. And what he was trying to do was to assemble in portfolio form a series of textiles, in fact all the textiles produced in France of that year and consequently three or four years beyond that, as a means of evaluating exactly the kind of money that France was producing in textiles during the 18th century or at least during the period of, of his reign. Having been allowed to explore and uh, research with this material, I then began to understand textiles far more deeply. The, the volumes involved, the textile samples, the dyes used to create them, the types of loom they were woven on, and the number of harnesses, and the mechanical developments of these textiles. So that as I began to put together a picture of the clothing of New France for use at Fortress Lewisburg, I understood that I really, or be, at least began to understand, that I didn't know it enough about the mechanics of textiles, that I really should take some studies in knowing how to weave. So I enrolled myself into the London School of Weaving, while I was also going to college in, in London, and learned the basic technologies of textiles, handloom weaving, knitting, tapestry making, carpet making. So in each trip back and forth to France after that point, I understood textiles far more intimately. And as a consequence, I came back to Canada to work at Fortress Lewisburg, taught the ladies in, in Lewisburg how to weave the fabrics similar to those used in the 18th century, then to make whalebone corsets from whalebone that we found in uh, Britain at the time, and reproduced these costumes that very much give an idea what 18th century France must have looked like. This teaching sojourn for me was a, it was a new thing for me, uh, from theatre designing suddenly to becoming a teacher. And I was requested by the then chairman of the theatre department at Dalhousie University to consider being part of their staff. I thought about it for a short while and decided, well, why not? It was a, uh, a chance to start something that had not been done in Canada at that time. So I established the Costume Studies Program, and that is a program specifically to train young people in order to work in theatre or in the fashion industry. Uh, it's essentially a cutting program, learning how to cut and create clothing. But at the same time, they have to know a great deal about textiles and lace, fabrics, dyeing, printing, and all the mechanical devices used to make textiles the very lively art form they are today. I have a, uh, my own historic collection of textiles, which I use for as examples, plus historic garments and lace collection, which is very important for the students to see and touch and thereby understand more about these textiles. Putting this program together, which is a two-year program, gave rise to possibly doing this series and I have created a series of five episodes that might help to explain to those of you who are not particularly involved with textiles but would like to know a little more about them. Through the five series we're going to go to a textile shop in Halifax and look at the enormous range of textiles available to us today. We will then go to my studio and look at a handloom and look at what a handloom does and is functioning we will then take a trip to no uh, Windsor, Nova Scotia, to a textile mill to watch how raw cotton is spun and processed and knitted into tubular form that is the basis for making t-shirts, jogging wear, underwear, etc. And then we'll look at some historic slides that will show how textiles were used historically and their various uses. And then we'll show us some slides of Fortress Lewisburg and the work that ultimately began as this research project some 10 years ago. I think it's very important that we understand textiles because the world has made enormous uh, wealth from textiles and they're rather disregarded today simply because we have so much around us. And I think it's very important to just take a little look at them and maybe the next time when you're buying clothing or you're looking after the dry cleaning of washing of clothing, you'll understand a little more about how to approach them and what things they can do and what they cannot do. So for the first episode, let us proceed now to Goodman Textiles and we'll look at the many 
fabrics in the shop and we'll talk a bit about uh, patterns. I have some 19th century patterns to show you and some dressmakers books of the 19th century plus some modern patterns and we'll explore this, the world of modern textiles. So without any more delay, let's wander on down now to Goodman Textiles in Halifax, Nova Scotia. We're now in downtown Halifax at Goodman Textiles to look at the range of fabrics available to us today on the market. I think of the four natural fibers, um, wool, silk, cotton, linen, and of course rayon. Rayon, although made from wood pulp, was designated a natural fiber, fiber some years ago. But wool certainly is the magic one. It's probably where, where more money is spent producing, creating, manipulating, trying to invent new processes of, trying to make it less shrinkable, that we find wool has a far more valuable uh, commodity on today's market. Certainly, many of the great uh, textile mills throughout the world have made their fortunes with this fiber. It comes from the sheep, and in fact, only the hair from the sheep is, is designated wool. All other hairs from other animals are known as uh, just their hair, like, like mohair. This is mohair. It's woven into a, to a skein of yarn at the moment, but mohair comes from a goat. It doesn't have the same crimp as does wool, and therefore doesn't have the shrink, same shrinking capacity, not nearly as valuable overall. Wool has two types. There is a brushed wool, which contains much more air and is therefore more comfortable for wearing in, in colder climates. There is a worsted wool, which by its processing gives a very clean fabric. This jacket that I'm wearing is a worsted serge, and it has a very clean face. It is not as warm, but it has a nice smooth finish. The one thing that the wool has that makes it the magic fiber that it is, is its elasticity. We find that wool, because of its, of its nature, it has a, a lot of nice wearable elasticity. And as you begin to wear wool, it stretches. And the elbows will pull out of shape and the back will become more comfortable. Pockets begin to stretch. The fronts of trousers begin to stretch. Skirts begin to stretch. However, when they are dry cleaned, the dry cleaning process again allows the fabric to go back into its pre-state uh, shape form. Wool therefore has um, a lot of problems in that way because people t tend to want stable fabrics. They get rather annoyed when they throw things into the washing machine and it shrinks and they don't really want to take the time to care for them properly. We have on the market many other fibers. This is an acrylic, a mixture of acrylic and nylon, which is used or designed in, in recent years to try and solve a lot of the problems for the, for the home sewer, the home knitter, and prevent possibly uh, the damage of, of shrinking by washing. This wonderful plastic yarn made up into this sweater gives quite a, a glorious um, texture in, in the garment and indeed is one of the reasons why knitting has become so popular today. And when you regard the, the price of knit goods on the market, it's not surprising to find people are indeed taking a lot of time to knit these wonderful garments from these unusual plastic yarns. Unfortunately, unlike wool, these have no breathing capacity. Wool being a natural protein fiber has uh, that potential organic quality that makes them very comfortable. People have often complained about, because uh, acrylics and the plastic yarns don't breathe, they tend to feel clammy. Nevertheless, they are easy to care for and certainly produce some very, very fine and very novel approaches to textiles. Now we will look at the second important uh, category of textiles, silk, another protein fiber, and we'll look at some of the mysteries behind silk. This is a piece of silk I have in my hand. This is Thailand silk, Thai silk as it's known commonly in the market, and it has quite a peculiar rustle. This rustle is caused by the gum that is still in inherent in the fabric that is left there from the actual silkworm itself. The origin of silk goes very back into the distant past, and it's difficult to know exactly where it was indeed uh, developed. We know that it was created, first of all, in China, and probably came to its best uh, development in, in the Orient. But his actual bringing back into Western culture is very difficult to um, pinpoint. Some say it was brought in by a Chinese pr princess being married to an Italian in the during the Renaissance. Others believe the tale of the two Buddhist monks sent to China um, by the Roman Emperor around 320 AD to bring the secret of silk back. 
very costly fiber, very luxurious fiber. And in actual fact, it comes simply from the cocoon made by the silkworm in order for him to pass through from the moth stage, through the larva stage, to the pupa stage, and eventually complete the cycle. The filament that we know as silk comes from two channels on either side of its mouth, called sericin, and is glued together with a, a liquid known as fibrion. It's this fibrion, the gum that you're hearing in the silk today. That filament gummed together is wound around the body of the silkworm until the cocoon is finally processed, and that allows the metamorphous process of the silkworm to change from the larva stage into the moth, and there brought back completes its cycle. The cocoon itself is probably no larger than my thumb, and on that cocoon is approximately one mile of very fine silk filament. That is fine cultured silk. And this is, as I said, Thai silk. It's oftentimes referred to as wild silk or raw silk. There is no real such terminology. Raw silk or wild silk simply means silk has been found in the wilds created by moths who were not under any special cultivation. They are collected by the, the silk gatherers and the silk is produced in much the same fashion, except that the cocoon, when the, the silkworm has become a moth, it emits an acid which dissolves part of the top of the cocoon, and this allows the moth to escape. Therefore, the fibers that come from that cocoon are not one mile in length, but very short, three-inch long fibers. So they're combed into a much thicker, coarser fabric, and therefore this kind of fabric is the result of it. We have here in front of us another type of silk from much the same source. This is a, a wonderfully simple striped silk, good for cottons or dresses. It almost seems too simple to be called silk. One is so used to seeing the, the highly lustrous versions of it. We also have a rather unusual fabric just recent on the market called silk corduroy. We all know about silk velvet. It's certainly been one of history's very elaborate and flamboyant fabrics. This brings it into a much more contemporary line. Silk corduroy was initially invented in the 17th century and produced just for kings, and hence the name corduroy, the cloth of the kings. This is a very handsome fabric. Because the, the expense of producing silk and the special care it requires, society has become inundated by copies of, or the attempts at producing synthetic silks. Originally in the, in the 19th century, we had a fiber known as rayon, in actual fact from wood pulp, as a means to try supplying the need for silks on, on the common market. The rayon produced is a fabric not too unlike this. It has the sheen of silk. Just unfold this for a moment. The sheen and luster of traditional silk, and yet it is made from wood pulp. It is made not too unlike the, the original way silk is produced. The wood pulp is reduced to a, to a chemical compound and then placed through a spinneret, a rather shower-like headpiece that produces very fine silk filaments or silk-like filaments exactly the way the silkworm produced them. So we have the synthetic or artificial silk. We also have polyester silks. This is a polyester taffeta, with exactly the same handle as silk taffeta, has probably a different um, body to it, and I think it's much more static charged in use, but for all intents and purposes, this is uh, artificial silk, now using polyester as its medium. To show the difference, I have a piece of white, pure silk taffeta, and there really is very little difference. One has a nice quality, unfortunately, that the polymer doesn't have. Silk has that capacity of being warm in the wintertime and cool in the summertime, plus for its luxurious shape, of course. Another fabric that's very much on the market these days is lace. We find lace being used for bridal uses and evening wear. This piece of lace was woven on a multi-needle uh, machine. It has been re-embroidered by a fine mohair uh, braid. But the development of lace goes back to about the 1800s when women used to sit for hours making the very fine mesh that constitutes lace as a fabric. And of course, in the 19th century, they, they devised a loom or a special machine to produce this. And they began then to embroider the lace onto this yardage. It's now become a very popular fabric. And because they had to invent a machine specifically for the production of this mesh, 
they then began to find other uses for the machine and eventually have created fabrics far in excess of the loom. I have another piece of fabric here, again a synthetic. It is a very luxurious rayon metallic fabric. And when you think of, of the great paintings that show popes, kings, and queens, and aristocracy of various periods draped in gold thread of solid gold, it's not surprising we can now produce similar fabrics purely by plastic yarns. I show this just as another variation on the extraordinary range of synthetic fibers known to us today. We're going next to the cotton counter to look at what is now probably the most popular fabric on the market today, and we'll have a look at the wide range of their possibilities and their special uh, treatments. Before we discuss cottons and that particular type of textile, well, let's look at first briefly at linens, the oldest textile known to man, processed by man. In fact, this is a classic fiber developed by the Egyptians, for one which hears so much about historically. As you can see, this linen has a very nice white condition, in a later episode, I will demonstrate to you, or show you through slides, some of the historical treatments used to process linen. One of its advantages is that linen absorbs moisture from the air, therefore it feels cool to the touch, and is very good for wearing in summer weather. Unfortunately, it tends to wrinkle very badly. However, like all other fabrics being produced today, we are now getting mixtures of polylinens, polycottons, which is allowing them for a little more flexibility and ease of use. Tr linens are traditionally used for altar cloths or for tablecloths to be embroidered or to be decorated and embellished one way or the other. I have here a tea towel woven with a stripe, which once it's been washed a bit, will dry dishes very nicely and even polishes glass. It doesn't have a lint, therefore it's favored for washing dishes. And it's a very handy kitchen uh, item. You find a lot of household textiles being created in linen. Now, cottons. The reason I've kept cottons to the last is because much of the machinery produced today was produced because of the complexity of spinning this very fine fiber known as cotton, originally produced in India about the 13th, 14th century, and it was again grown in Egypt. We have Egyptian cotton, Indian cotton, Asiatic cotton, and of course the very finest cottons from the Georgia Islands in, in the States, in the United States of America. These are the finest range of cottons. Cotton fiber has a very short staple, about one and three quarters to two and a half inches long. And because of that, the machinery used to spin that has to travel at a far faster um, speed in order to create a, a, a fiber long enough to be woven into a textile. When we go to the uh, Nova Scotia textile mills in a later episode, we will then look at the raw fiber of cotton mixed with polyester being combed and spun and prepared in preparation for the knitting of t-shirt fabric. With recent trends in the last 10 years of ladies quilting and the need for cotton for that purposes, we now have, as you can see behind me, a very, very wide range of small print cottons. Something like this. Now these are cottons that reflect much of the 19th century. The small print itself was indeed developed during the 19th century, and since our need for bed quilts comes from that early colonial bed covering and the trend back to quilting, has revived this entire process of screen printing these small prints again. Now you find young girls, women, are producing garments with this very fine country look. This one with a blue with a very fine dot on it. And you'll find even larger ones, as we can see above me here, this cotton even is printed to look like it's been quilted. So it is, it's maintaining this entire process. But the cotton itself has gone through many centuries of uh, refinements to create the, the, cot the cotton fabric you see today. This was screen printed in Canada and is a very fine uh, garment weight. Cotton, again, because it is a cellular fabric, comes from a plant source, and its original use was not necessarily to produce fabric. It was indeed produced as a hair within the bud of the cotton ball plant. As the seed became grown to uh, maturity, the ball itself opens and bursts open, therefore revealing the cotton wool that's attached to each of the seeds. 
Each seed will have one single strand of cotton attached to it, and that is there to protect the cotton itself. When it rains or moisture descends on the plant, these fine fibers begin to move. They begin to move very softly and gently and are in effect drying the seed or keeping the seed dry. And that is why cotton feels so cool to wear and so comfortable to wear is because as the body perspires, the natural affinity for, co for cotton is to dry itself off. And that's why we find such a common fabric today. Cotton during the 19th century went through another process, a process known as mercerization, in which the cotton fiber itself was immersed in caustic soda, and that caused the fiber to lengthen itself and become highly polished. So we find mercerized cotton as a sheeny cotton, or a shiny cotton, with a much smoother finish, tends not to feel as comfortable on, although it maintains its, its look better, and it certainly has a crisper finish overall for a longer period of time. Natural cotton tends to, when it's washed, become heavily wrinkled and is therefore a little less attractive for a long-wearing garment. Nevertheless, both are being used and both very effectively used. So that our trend today and the mass market that was developed because of the need to produce more textiles, thanks to the cotton fiber itself, that allowed for machinery to be um, reinvented or to be speeded up process-wise, we then began to service the needs of a market that was developing very much around the end of the 18th century into the 19th century. And that's why we tend to look at the 19th century as the period of the Industrial Revolution, because most machinery was being produced at that time to supply the needs and demands of larger communities, larger societies. At the same time, with the fabric being produced in such mass quantities, we had an invention known as the sewing machine. And for that, I'm going to take you to another area and show you some patterns and discuss exactly what the sewing machine has given all of you for your present-day wearing needs. With the development of the sewing machine in 1851, it wasn't very long before most households had their own sewing machine. And books similar to this, this being published in 1873, began to be circulated for the needs of the home dressmaker so the ladies could keep abreast of fashion. Inside, they would find several hand-painted illustrations of the current mode of the, of the season, and they would begin to try and duplicate these as best they could. They would oftentimes take them to professional seamstresses and have them made at uh, private establishments, but it became increasingly more important to produce these things in your own home or take a basic garment from your wardrobe, alter the trimmings and the decoration. As a matter of fact, in these magazines was also included what was known as a supplement which I have an original one here, dated the same year. It's a gigantic supplement of 1873, and it unfolded from the book itself to illustrate a very large collection of variations on a theme. So that you can make an entire new garment from scratch, or you could indeed alter any of your day dresses, traveling dresses, summer dresses, household dresses into a, a wide variation of trimmings, and indeed make what looked like an, an entirely new garment. Let us not forget that it was not that easy to find fabrics in the 19th century, and you had to make the garments you did have go a very long way. The magic of this piece of pattern, as a matter of fact, is in actual fact the reverse of it. The first dressmaker patterns that were produced in the 19th century, and you can see the heading here, and it was indeed the pattern of a garment and you had to trace off the various pieces of patterns from this ma master plan, and then you could assemble the pieces as you understood them. This, of course, gave rise to several very uh, important innovations, one, of course, being the tracing wheel. Tracing wheel, then tissue paper, then an actual carbon back paper, which allowed for the pattern to be transferred from this onto brown paper or onto actually a fabric by itself. That is the 19th century variation, and we have come a very long way from that because now the world at large is sewing at a very rapid pace. I'm going to show you one of many uh, sewing books available for the home sewer today. It's made by Vogue Patterns, and inside you will find many variations on dress designs created by famous designers for the home sewer to take advantage of the, of the plethora of fabric available to us on the current market. I have in here, a pattern from 
this particular book. Excuse me, it's becoming a little awkward here. There we go. As you can see, the variations available for a wedding dress or a bridesmaid's dress or day dress, a summer dress, the style, relatively simple. Simply the application of fabric of a different type can indeed create an entirely different type of garment. These are then numbered, and you buy the pattern that coordinates to the design itself, and it comes in a package like this. This package has on the back of it various information about the sizes, the amount of fabric required, the what they call notions, that is tapes, sewing needles, braids, buttons, buckles, whatever was required to create the finished product on the front. Inside we have a development of the patterns we saw historically, and your pattern comes like this, and it really is a series of very carefully drawn and graded pattern pieces that will indeed give you that garment. I won't open it up because it become, it'll become far too lengthy to open this up at the moment. And of course, the one thing that the Victorian lady didn't have to hand was indeed a sheet of instructions. This sheet, once it's opened up, tells you very carefully, step by step, how that garment is assembled so that anybody who can handle a sewing machine relatively efficiently can indeed make their entire wardrobe. There was a time when no one made their own clothing up, up until a few years ago. Everybody was doing it, then it went, went into a bit of a decline. Now the trend is returning, and we find people, men and women, are now making their own clothing. The cost of it on the retail market certainly makes that a worthwhile adventure. So we've just seen so a visit very briefly through a textile shop where that one can buy any wide range of fabrics. In our next episode, we're going to go to my studio and look at a hand weaver's loom. And we'll learn exactly how simple weaving is achieved on these looms and talk a bit about the history of the loom. And then we'll let you see more at that point. Thank you very much. I think before we close this episode, I would like to thank Dr. Cherney, the owner of Goodman Textiles, for his enormous generosity in allowing the camera crew and myself to enjoy a day at the shop with complete freedom to move around in his building. It's interesting to note that in 1963, when I came to Halifax to work, first of all, for the Neptune Theatre, that the fabrics available to us then were extremely limited. And as watching a shop very much like Goodman Textiles expand and develop from its original small um, area in 1963 to its now larger uh, scaled shop, much more uh, modern um, textiles being introduced, and a very wide range of fabrics being offered to us. In our next episode, uh, as I mentioned, we will discuss the hand loom, and I will show you before that fibers that are used in weaving and the various processes. Thank you very much again. Mm -hmm.